Hello again, Saints. We thank everyone for tuning in to another Thursday night Bible study where we are going over the doctrine of who God has called us to be in Christ. And we are looking at Romans chapter 16. We're looking at Romans 16, and this is lesson 33. Lesson 33, and we're looking at the power of God versus the power of Satan and the elect and the called of God. The elect and the called of God. <clears throat> and when we're looking at that there, um, or just at, in looking at that, again, this is not a study to show God's power versus Satan's power. Um, not in a sense of the, the basic fundamental issues there, because that's not a bad study at, at all. We've, we've covered that before. But what this is, is we're looking at, in God's word, when him that is of power is establishing, establishing the ones that are strong in the faith. And you're going to see the ones that are the elect, ones that are the called. And we'll get all to the elect and the called in a little bit, though. But the idea is that, as I said before, and I'll say it again, when you, when you have someone that is of power, and just say, for instance, in government, if we put this in governmental um, perspectives, <coughs> excuse me, when you look at one that is of, of power, if someone tells you, well, we're going to establish you in the government, okay, well, someone will say, well, okay, well, I'm assuming if I'm just fresh off the street, someone's going to be establishing me in, um, in the issue of being the assistant to a representative, a state representative or somebody. And then that they, the assist, the other assistant will establish them in that power. But when you have the, well, if someone tells you, well, no, 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 no. The job we're going to give you of, of government is the president of the United States. In the government, he's going to establish you in So where we're going when we when you see this, this is vital to get this, folks. This is, you know, and when I speak to people about this, and when you know, I and I talk to people about it, and when you as we go on here, and I see people, you know, you get some people just look at me and say, okay, and then some people will say, whoa, because it's the idea when you understand it, when everything is lining up. And the doctrine is being built upon another foundational doctrine, another foundation. You can see the the glory that that is here, that that is ours. Because when I said the power, and um, what we need to understand is that we looked at last week. We looked at the issues about Satan, how he had Pharaoh as his man, and you had God, and he. God had, you, the, the Lord had Moses. That was his uh, man there. And Satan's man was representing him. Pharaoh was representing Satan. Satan was, was the most powerfulest man on the, in the world. Remember what, what uh, the Lord said. He, he used Pharaoh because what he did is he said, through him, I'm going to show my power, make my power known throughout the whole world. It wasn't that God was working with him, but God used Pharaoh as an instrument. He used Pharaoh as an instrument to show God's power on Pharaoh, as in on the wrath of God being poured out and, and, and stripping Pharaoh of, of his power, so to speak. And the whole world could bear witness to that. The whole world could come into Egypt and see and see famine and, and pestilence and all these different things in a place that was supposed to be paradise, supposed to be heaven on earth. And you had a Pharaoh reigning as a, a God, a deity. And again, when you look at what, what Moses came there, Moses was representing the people who Pharaoh thought so little of that he had them as slaves. So how do you think he would look upon the God of those slaves? 
he wouldn't hold them in any regard. He knew that he existed. He knew that their God existed, just like he had many other gods painted on the walls all throughout Egypt. He understood, he understood that there was a, a deity. He, was, he knew Moses wasn't bluffing. But the idea, folks, is that's the point here that throughout time, God has had representatives representing him. Whether it was Stephen standing up there full of the Holy Ghost, saying, he was saying in, 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 in God's stead, he was full of the Holy Ghost. He was full, it was God's words coming out of the mouth of Stephen bearing witness unto Israel, unto Satan's men. It doesn't matter if you take a look at Job. When Job, what, what did the Lord say? Have you considered my servant? Here's my representative. And again, it, this happened, the same thing in the garden. In the garden, you had Adam being put out there as God's help meet. Satan waltzed up there and said, oh, this is what you have here? Okay. And throughout time, whether it was Melchizedek, whether it was all throughout time, you have the men of God standing up against Satan. And we too, and this is where it's all going, Philippians, if we get a chance to look at Philippians chapter 2, how we ought to be, we ought to be as ones that are standing out as beacons of light, as light in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, regardless of what's going on around us. You have to stand by his word alone, not by what this world is teaching you. Because just like as the Lord told, and we'll look at the verses over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you should be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And I'm going to say this here, and then we'll get to the verses. You can, you know, you liken this to, in a sense, um, uh, fighters or boxers, just say, for instance, here in the, here in the Detroit community, there, there's a big boxing uh, camp called Croc Boxing, and they put out Tommy Hearns, and he even uh, did so many other boxers, world champions, well, their boxing gym was looked upon as world-renowned. And you had other gyms, gym, boxing gyms, that said, well, hey, we're going to pit our fighters against your fighters. And, and we're, we're going to put our best on display. Well, the trainer himself, the one that's training the people up, he's looked upon as, as the best. And these people are representing him. And I'm saying all this to say for those that don't even understand what I'm talking about there. When you, God himself as him that is of power, he's establishing us in the power. And this isn't, this isn't, and when we looked at the different stages of the identity, we looked at the issue of Romans 6 identity. Actually, yeah, Romans 5, and then you see in Romans 6, <clears throat> Romans 3 through 5. But then when you see in Romans 6, you have the identity of sanctification to understand that look, I'm identified with him, buried with him, rose with all these things that you are planted together. Then you're told the necessity to, to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. And, and that identity right there of just wanting to serve him. Then when you get over to Romans chapter 8, you're taught about having a word of God mind, being a son, a son that desires to be educated and by him and be taught his word, his will, his way, his life. And then when you get over to Romans 12, being a living sacrifice, not only just being that son, but now being able to operate upon that in selfless love. You're being educated in his selflessness. Even when you get persecuted, it go all all the way through Romans 12 up until the end of the uh, end verses. It tells you, okay, now you're operating upon selflessness. You're going to have enemies. There's going to be them that persecute you. How are you going to How are you going to respond? Respond in you're a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice would would take persecution. You know why? Because it's not about himself. The idea is they're not persecuting me. They're persecuting my father. They're, they're persecuting the word, not me. I'm a, 
That's what a sacrifice, that's how a sacrifice thinks. Then when you get to Romans chapter 13, verse 14, well, actually verse 9 on down, but verse 14, you're told to put ye on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You're, you're taught not only can you be a living sacrifice, but you put him on. That's an identity. You're adorning the doctrine. That's an identity. Then when you look at Romans 14, right there, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. Well, if he's weak in the faith and you're receiving him, what are you going to receive him about? You receive him to your door if he comes to your No, the doctrine to teach him, to give him. At verse 15, chapter 15 says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Isn't that selflessness? Not to please ourselves? But every one of us, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ please not himself. That's an identity. Now you're being given another identity as a Bible teacher, one that's strong in the faith. But now, that's not it. When you get to Romans 16, you're given an identity there as those that Paul is laying out in Romans 16. He's laying out those saints who were persecuted, those saints that would lay down their life, that lay down their neck for another co-laborer's life. This is oper operating upon that power, folks, is you understanding that the God of peace, the doctrine of the God of peace, will and can bruise Satan under your feet. Your feet. If you allow it. And if you, if you allow this doctrine to build up in you. And again... We go over the review. It, 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 you know what? I'm, I grow as I'm teaching this doctrine, folks. And as we go into the review, we're going to see um, this is that that suit that structure there, the superstructure. It, it is more than I fathomed it to be, and and, and it's a shame unto myself that that um, that that I didn't comprehend. Um, its value as I as I should have, and you know what? Uh, that's just a reproof and rebuke unto myself that I didn't even that that I didn't see all that glory that is contained, and especially here in Romans chapter sixteen. That power, folks. We we are God's we are God's soldier. We are His. No man that warth entangle himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him, our Father, who hath what? Chosen us. And we're gonna we'll probably look at that next week, that those verses there. But that choosing us as God is taking God God has us. And I'm talking about I'm not talking about this every saint. God would have every saint. It, it's as I said it's similar. You got people in a boxing gym there and you got a person that's training training his best up, and he said, okay, here's my fighter here. Go out there and go to war. And God desires saints that he can, he desires sons, mature, strong, perfect sons to, to, to war with him. And only the perfect can be able, be doctrinally able to be the called according to his purpose, and be the elect as being spoken of. The elect and the called are the ones that God is saying, have you considered my son or have you considered my daughter? And, and, and there you go. When, and another last thing here, when Paul said over 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, with it, chapter 11 and chapter 12, when you see all the stuff going on there, you see the sufferings of Christ, you see, you see Paul suffering, you see Satan's ministers and Satan, and you see glory. Paul's not going over what happened to him and saying, oh, look at what happened to me. Oh, um, uh, he wants people to understand I fought fights and everything. No, 
He's glorying in this stuff. He's glorying in it. He's glorying in the idea that he defeated the enemy. He defeated Satan. And God's response, the Lord's response to him was, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect, perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, most gladly, I would rather glory my firmness. At the power, the power, folks, the power of Christ may rest upon me, he said. And it can rest upon you as well. The power. We're being established and educated in the power. But the one way to put it on display, and I'm not going to say the only way, but the most excellent way to put it on display is when we suffer. Only way you're going to suffer is when you testify of this ungodly world. And the video I put out, I put out a video about, about uh, the attributes of Satan. The attributes of Satan um, uh, against, well, attributes of Satan by the pastor and by the church. And I put that out, you know, and people's response was, oh my gosh, how can you dare say things like that about music or about uh, uh, pastor anniversary days or about what we do as uh, for fun activities? Well, you know what? The unsaved does that. And a church, the church of the living God, ought to be living unto him, serving him, not serving this world. You ought to shine forth as beacons of light in the midst of a perverse crooked nation. Your church activities, your church service should not look like the place down the street. Shouldn't. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Remember, the Corinthians and Galatians were justified unto eternal life, but they wanted to look like the other people. They wanted to look like the, the Jew. They wanted to look like the, um, the, the ones that were rich, the, the idol worshipers or whatever the issue was, but God could not receive them. Many people that rightly divide the word of truth do not understand this fact, and they are living after the practices, traditions, commandments, rudiments of this world. But they don't understand this. Folks, you got to get this. It, 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 it's truly, truly essential. Let's finally move on. Romans 16. Look at verse, um, look at verse 25. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. We saw that before. When, when someone says now, they're saying something they want you to. Now, I want you to get this. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of mystery, which is kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the ever, everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Now, when we, we looked at this, we looked at the whole of it, all three verses there last time. And. This is all one this is all one particular issue that we're being established in. God's not just only going to establish us in in just justification unto eternal life. And that's not what Paul is referring to when he says my gospel. Paul's not saying not to him is a power to establish you according to justification unto eternal life and the preacher of Jesus Christ on according to Revelation of Mystery. No, that my gospel is a a, a plethora, if you will, of things that he's laying out right here. And the idea is that now made manifest, he's talking about it, what, what his revelation that was given out to him is now made manifest. And he says, and by the scriptures of the prophets, Paul also uses scriptures of the prophets. We too, as Romans 15 says, it's for our learning. So, it, it's it's by that as well. The verses we're going to be using in a second is coming out of the scriptures of the prophets. Uh, but again, come over to, matter of fact, come over to Exodus chapter 9. 
and we'll get to the to God only wise um, and all that next time. Uh, but we'll probably deal with the whole issue of the um, the called and the um, the elect issue and the chosen issue that you we need to see that just as what we're about to see now, we are God's man, God's godly woman. That's what we are represent. He's we are the ones he's putting forth and saying here onto Satan and this world. That's how we ought to be. If you choose to, if you choose to enter into that, if you choose to train up for that battle or that war, choice is yours, folks. You got the doctrine in front of you. you eat, but but you need the heart. You need the selfless heart in order to put this operation into practice. Exodus 9, verse, Exodus 9. Verse 13, Exodus chapter 9, verse 13. And we're looking at the Mo Moses. He was the most high God's representative. And you're looking at Satan's representative, which was Pharaoh. Verse 13, and, and the Lord said unto Moses, rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. Now, when Pharaoh, when Moses said this, it, it, it would have been impossible for Pharaoh to take a sword and run it through Moses. Moses would not have, Moses was bearing testimony of the Lord. Pharaoh could not stop that testimony from being brought forth. Just like today, Satan cannot stop the testimony of our Lord being brought forth. It is you that is that that are the that is the one that can actually oppose your own self and oppose your Lord and Savior and oppose your Father. It, we are the only ones that can put the brakes on that. But notice he says, "Stand before and say unto him." But this is, but he's representing the Lord here. Verse 14, for I will at this time send all, send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people. Notice his, well, why, do you think, why do you think he has to tell Pharaoh that not only am I going to do it upon your heart, but I'm going to do it upon you and your people because your people are serving you in your servant Satan, but you see the power that Pharaoh had here. And he says, uh, verse 14 again, for I will at this time send all, notice this, all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people. And, and this is now all the Lord has plagues that he has at his, at his disposal. This is the ones he's going to send. He's going, they're, they're all going to be on Pharaoh's heart. And all of the plagues that the Lord decides to, decides to send will be upon his servants and his people. That thou mayest know. Notice this, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. That's, that's very important to get that. The possessor of heaven, the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth because Pharaoh thought there was none like him in all the earth. And I guarantee you Pharaoh more than likely said that one time at least. Whoa, there's none like me in all the earth. Look at verse 15. For now I will stretch out my hand that I might smite thee and thy people with pestilence and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And many people say, wait a minute, there was innocent people there. There was innocent babies and, and, and people that, little old ladies, and people had nothing to do with anything. Well, they all served Pharaoh, and they all thought Pharaoh, there was none like Pharaoh in the earth. And the babies themselves and, and the children and things of that nature, folks, that people would say, oh, well, is God a cruel and cruel God? No, God is a righteous God. 
and God sending forth his hand to smite the people, he'd be also smiting him who would also raise up to be a part of that people. And again, the righteousness of God, there is none like him in all the earth. Look at, um, he says, that thou, may, thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And that cutting Pharaoh off, it was cutting off that power, that power source, that source where he, the war, he shined unto the world. The world come unto Pharaoh. Pharaoh had all kind of things, riches and gains, and he was the king of the earth. But again, after God would do this, he wouldn't be looked upon as that. Verse 16, and in the very deed for this cause, I have raised thee up. Yeah, see that? In this very, in the very deed for this cause, I have raised thee up. He's going to show his power, his wrath being placed on Pharaoh, stripping him of his power, defeating him and his trainer, Satan, defeating them, beating them with pestilence, with, with the plagues that God put upon him. Look at this here in 16 again. Verse 16, and in, in the very deed for this cause have I raised thee up for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. And Because guess what? If the people of the earth just say Greece at that time is saying, wait a minute, Pharaoh was the most powerful man in the world. What happened to him? Who could do such a thing to him? There's one pow more powerful than him? Exactly. And that's what God did. And all the world had the same vantage point to be able to look at the Middle East, look at Egypt there, and see what happened in there. And, and, and when the, the judgment, just say Exodus chapter 30, uh, when you see those judgments based upon uh, uh, turning Egypt into desert, when you see over in Exodus 28 30, and 30, all that, it, it became desert. It was, it used to be fruitful, but now look at it. It's, it's considered the desert. There's nothing over there but, but uh, relics of, of man's foolishness. Look at 1 Samuel. Come over to 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now, we looked at these last week, but I I want you to look at it in the, the view of being the called, being the one who's representing God as his soldier, as his elect, his chosen, his, his perfect, yeah, the called. Look at uh, chapter, verse 5. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 5. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like the other, like all the nations. But this thing displeased Samuel when they say, Give us a king to judge us. You know, that displeased Samuel, but the thing that really displeased God, not just that, but the like all the nations thing. That's the, that's the key. If they just said, give us a king of judges, eh, well, and I know they just they said that, but if their intent was, hey, you know what? We all think we're all faithful here, and we all are operating upon judgment and wisdom. What if we had one... Um, we, what if we call out one to judge even the judges? You know, but see, that's where God was. God's word was to do that. That's where the Lord's position was. You have these people saying, oh, wait a minute. You know what? We want a king to uh, over us. Wait a minute. You have the Lord over you. Yeah, well, we don't want the Lord over us. We want, uh, we want our king like they have. We want an earthly king to judge over us. That's the point here. And that's what is that they're doing. They're cutting the, the Lord to the heart here by saying we would rather have a king to judge us. Um, 
And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, verse 7, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. They desired to have another king, an earthly king. They desired the earth, the people of the earth, a man of the earth, to reign over them. Doesn't that sound familiar to Pharaoh? What was happening with Pharaoh? And he had he was reigning over others. God wanted judges so he could have all sons and daughters. He could have sons judging his own group. And what I mean by his own, remember, the Lord was the ultimate king, the ultimate judge. We 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 get that. But when a king rules, he puts out his own sets of rules, taxes, his own sets of do's and don'ts. When you have a judge, a judge takes those do's and don'ts and he judges righteously by based upon what's being given to him. He takes what's put in front of him and the judge says, okay, yay or nay. He says, well, you know what? I understand what happened here, and let me use equity on this matter. Let's just operate upon equity in this decision here. Let's be, let's take myself out the equation. Let's judge selflessly in whatever's in front of us. But a king doesn't do that. A king says, hey, I don't answer to anyone. There's none like me in all the land. There's none like me. That's the point there, folks. It's not just the judge versus the king and judge versus the... That's not what it's about there. It's deeper than that. It's reigning, serving, worship, power. That's the point. Power. A king exercises power over others, even those judges in 1 Samuel there. That's the point. Let's move on here. Come over to uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and again, folks, this is, this is good doctrine that we ought to get. And I hope, it's my hope and prayer and heart's desire that every single member of his body gets this understanding, this understanding about the foundation that Romans is built upon. And when you get to Romans chapter 16, it is setting all that into what he put forth. That mutual faith, both of you and me, we can have the same mutual faith understanding that Paul possessed when he wrote this. You don't think so? Well, <laughs> allow it to resonate within you folks and you will see. And, and, and we can have that same mutual faith as Paul said in Romans chapter 1, that he desired to impart unto them. And I'm desiring... <laughs> Hopefully that we all can be of the same mutual faith and we all can be of the same mind. We all can speak the same thing. And I ask pastors all the time and, and they'll stand there and look at me when I say, do you think we can all be of the same mind? Do you think we can all speak the same thing? Or is God's word untrue when he says that that's the case? Be of one mouth, one mind. And, and they, they say nothing to me. Because they know God is not a liar. They know it is possible for God's word to be, uh, that, that, that we can be all of the same mind. It's possible, but they don't know how. But when a person like myself put out nine different videos on it, they, they, would they take a look at it? Of course not. Why would they? Why? You know, I know why. Because how could I know? Why would I know? Why wouldn't they know? Why wouldn't they have heard it first? See, our heart, folks, that's how our heart works. It works in that instant right there. That Romans 8, verse 27. Come over to Romans 8, verse 27. It's, uh, it's sad and a, and, and a shame. Verse 8, verse Chapter 8, verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, 
because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. See, you know, and, and, and if, at this point here, if you don't understand that the will of God is spiritual things only, by this point here, you need to go back and get it. And that's what people need to do. People come over here and they see this verse and they use it with prayer or sufferings of this present time. And they'll say, well, when we're praying for our loved one to be healed, if it's in God's will, then it'll happen. You know, God doesn't do it all the time, but he will and can do it if it's his will to do so, you know. Well, folks, it's not his will to do it. It's not his will to deal with your outward flesh. Your outward flesh is was is is sinister is what you just got through reading from Romans chapter one all the way up to that point and it is only use that it can be of, of is this world you see that your flesh cannot please God why why would he heal it why would he bless it that is not the will of God so Notice verse 28, and we know that all things, all things, sufferings is in the context. All sufferings work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, not your purpose. Your purpose will have sufferings taken away. But I like to compare this all the time with 2 Thessalonians, 2 Corinthians, when Paul says, when Paul besought the Lord three times to take it away from him, all things work together for good to him, to, to, to Paul. And notice it's it can work together for good because you, you too can say, yes, yeah, I love God. I love God selflessly. I operate upon his selfless love. So it's for his sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Christ's strength is made perfect in my weakness. That's what someone that loves someone do. And notice, if see, people think that this means to them that love God because he justified them. Oh, I love God because he loved, He first loved me. Oh, I love God because I'm going to heaven. I love God because I, he, he gave me the rapture. I, I got the rapture. He gave me his word. That's not selfless love you're operating upon. You, you don't you fully don't even see his selflessness even in those yet his selflessness is shown in the idea he wants you to he, he not only justified you but he called you to be a son unto him as Galatians chapter 4 says but look at uh we know that all things work together for good to them that love God selflessly love God to them who are the called. I used to read this, folks, and I, I didn't even see that word, the. I used to read this, and I used to say over and over, to them who are called according to his purpose. To them who are called. That's how, that's how I read it, because that's how I looked at it and understood it. To them who are the called. Not all saints are the called. And if you've been sticking with me through this video here, based upon even just this, you know that there are some vessels to honor some vessels to dishonor. The vessels of honor are the ones that are the called according to his purpose. The vessels of dishonor are the justified in Christ who are the called according to their own purpose. Look at verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he did also pre... And the whom here is the ones that are the called according to his purpose. We know that God foreknew all saints. We get that. He he did predestinate. Um, he, he did he 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 desired to all be justified. And we get that. But let's just look at the verses here. Verse twenty nine. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Again, God foreknew that he would have the call according to his purpose, that he'd have perfect saints, ones that are strong in the faith, that ones that he that can be conformed to the image of his son, just like Timothy was, just like Titus, just like Paul was. 
and, and the other saints that Paul mentioned in Romans chapter 16. Uh, moreover, whom he did predestinate them, he also called them. Wh whom he called them, he also justified. And whom he justified them, he also glorified. See, folks, you know what? These things, uh, God desires ones that he can say, this is a son in whom I am well pleased. If you're conformed to the image of his son, aren't you going to be putting on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as per Romans chapter 13, verse 14? Sure you are. Aren't you going to be having operate upon the mind of Christ as we see in 1 Corinthians? Aren't you, are you not going to be putting on the whole armor uh, as you see in Rome, uh, Ephesians chapter 6? Aren't you going to be ones that are going to be put in uh, uh, Ephesians 5 and put it on in uh, Colossus 3? Well, of course. And you know what that will make you? Let's read on. Look at verse 33. Actually, verse 32. He that spared not his own. Actually, verse 31. What shall we say to these things if God be for us who can be against us? And you know what? He's for us. He's for, why, why do you think he's, he's for you based upon his selfless love for you? All them things you've seen there, those things that you're going to say, what shall we say to these things? What things? Justified us, glorified us. He predestinated us. He called us. He foreknew us. He, he's, he, he's the firstborn among many brethren for our sake. We're brothers and sisters with the Lord. We're being conformed to the image of his son. Now, what should you say to those things? What, what should you say to the things that I just said? He, what? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son. Look at the selflessness here. But delivered him up for us. He delivered him up for you. He spared not his own son for you. And not only just that, he also delivered him up for your perfection. How shall we, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now those all things are spiritual things, folks. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You're counted as God's elect. And you know what? In a battle, because you're going to see battle words being used in a minute. In a battle, you'd be his champion. It, what's being considered here? Those things. Who shall say anything to God's soldier? We'll just say that God's soldier. And I use the word champion because of the, what's going to become said in a minute about we are more than conquerors through him that loved us conquerors more than conquerors that's as god's champion is he's not just a soldier but the, the one that won the battle and guess what this is uh circling around to folks and the god of peace shall bruise satan under your feet if satan is bruised doesn't that mean he took a blow or whether it's a blow from your foot your foot is the one that's bruising him. God's using you to fight. I'm not saying using him to fight your bat, his battle, but you are engaged in, engaged in the war if you want to be. Verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also maketh intercession for us. And again, when people see intercession for us, they think, oh, I got problems. Where are you at, God? God, come help me out. That is that that is beyond Corinthian. That, that, that's Corinthian. Look at um look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? See, when people see that, it's often thought that nobody will separate me from Christ's love. Christ got me a uh, 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 Christ going to show his love in me. When tribulation come, Christ going to take care of it. When distress come my way, give it over to God. God's going to zap it away from me in his own time. That's not what this is talking about at all. 
Who shall separate me from operating upon the selfless love of Christ? That's what's being said here. Who shall separate me from operating upon Christ's love? The way he would operate upon it. Shall tribulation? Well, Christ operated upon it. He, when he went through tribulation, he operated upon selflessness. Distresses? Selflessness. Persecution or famine, nakedness, peril or sword? All those things, we're, we're counted in all these things, folks. You're told, even though uh, distressed, but not perplexed, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Even though your outward man's going through that, the selfless love of Christ operating in you is going to tell you, it's not about me. When I'm weak, Christ's strength is made perfect in my weakness. That's the love of Christ. I, I hope we're getting this, folks. I, if you got to go back over it again, it is worth it to go back over this again. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, notice this here, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. You know, when people see this, they must look at this for my sake. He is killed all the day long. Because many people, they, they desire, they, they, they read over this evidently. But it says, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. And that's how you to count your life. That's how you to count your flesh. That's how you to count your sake. Isn't someone being killed all day long a living sacrifice? Well, of course it is. A living sacrifice is killed all the day long. It is one that's being accounted as a sheep for the slaughter. This isn't just a sheep for the slaughter, folks, is a sacrifice. You're being sacrificed all the day long. You're being a living sacrifice. All the day long. I'll just put it into that perspective. Because this isn't just saying, oh, you know, you got a you got a, a rabbit, he's just running out there and he's somebody's lunch. That's not what this is, being killed all the day long. This is sacrifice. This is someone bringing up, you bringing up yourself as sheep for the slaughter. Look at verse 37. Verse 37, nay. And why do you think it says nay? Because, well, we'll get to that later. In all these things, we are, because in other words, it could be yay in all these things, but because he's trying to get the understanding of, 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 of the saints to understand being a living sacrifice, living sacrifice operating upon the selfless love of Christ. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You see that fighting there? You see the issue there? If you're more than conqueror, you're, you're in battle. You're in battle, and you're ones that are fight. You're engaged in the fight, and you just conquered someone or something. But not only just conquered, you got the glory in it. You got people, again, as I said, with boxing. You have people that are not just to champion they're, they're the undisputed champion or they're undefeated champion and, and again this is more than a conqueror verse 38 for i am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor anything present nor anything to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of christ love of god which is in christ jesus our lord Do you know what that's saying there? Death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come. All those things listed there, folks, cannot hurt you. We know death could take you out of here physically. We know that uh, sufferings can hurt you. We, we, we get that. But this cannot do anything to your inward man through Christ Jesus and the love of God. If you operate upon the selfless love of God, none of these things 
can do anything to harm you. You can be more than a conqueror over all those things. Each and every one of those things on that list, you can be more than a conqueror through the love of God. Folks, the only way to operate upon any doctrine in God's word of truth is you have to love him enough and love his word enough to be a living sacrifice, to put your own word down, to put your own, to put this world's word down, to put this, your life, sacrifice your life, your, this, this, uh, as the Lord said, deny all this ungodly world. And Paul even says that denying ungodly uh, um, lust and things like that. And reprove them. We can, we can reprove those things when they come up. You know why? Because our flesh ought not have want those things. You know why? Because we, we can crucify that. It, it's been crucified. It, 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 if you look upon it that way, you can use the word, putting the word on. But the perfect in Christ, the elect in Christ, the called, uh, the chosen, the soldiers, folks, this doctrine here, when you see this, as I said over in Romans chapter, uh, Romans chapter 8, we just looked at, you'll understand it's by the selfless love of, of God. And that's why it says nothing separates us from the love of Christ. And then it says the love of God, the things that are in, in, in verse, you see verse 35 there, it's explaining all the things that Christ went through. That's why it says tribulation, persecution, famine, nakedness, perilous war. Well, the Lord went through those things. That's the love of Christ. His selfless love operated in those things. It didn't separate him. Then when you read down further, it talked about death, life, principalities and powers, and all the, those things. Those are things that your father deals with and dealt with in uh, uh, those things, whether it's death. He oper how he operates upon it, how he operates upon life, principalities, powers, might, stones, and dominion, he operates upon it with selfless love. And it should not, and you ought to as well. Your thinking ought to be as God the Father's thinking is in those things. You you ought to be earnestly desiring to, that the bond, that the creature be brought back under God's headship and, and everything else and, and all the other things. But let's move on. We're running short on time here. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse uh look at verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. Now, you know, this is these verses many people use to say, hey, this is how you get a person saved. And, you know, if you take it out of context, you, you actually, I mean, you could uh, give it to them uh, to show, to, to it's one of the verses you can use. And people point out Romans chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, another verse they take out of context to say, well, this is how you get someone saved with that. You know, folks, we have to do it like, like Paul did it there. You have to show people wrath, the wrath consciousness first. You have to show the un, unbeliever that he is worthy of the wrath of God, that there is a God first and foremost. As Paul pointed out in Romans chapter 1, you have creation to bear witness that there's a God and all these other things. And now, look at you. You are without excuse. For two chapters, he put the, he put the, uh, he showed the Jews were without excuse. He showed that the Gentiles were without excuse. Even the ones that never heard of a God is without excuse. All mankind is without excuse is what he did. And that's what we have to do when we get people justified, to get people justified unto eternal life, and then you give them the good news. All that, what I just said, is not contained in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But again, this is talking about service. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is showing you service, but it's explaining the selfless love of Christ is showing Christ's selflessness, and it's explaining that you ought to, based upon the your operating upon the selfless love of Christ, 
you ought to also be reconciled unto him as a servant to, 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 to work together with him in the doctrine, in the ministry. That's the point of what's being spoken of. But he's using Christ's love in that he gave up of himself and that he and the father gave up of himself and delivered his only son for us. That's what's being shown here and that they did it for a people to reconcile them and, and to save them and justify them unto eternal life. That's their selflessness in it. And you're being given their selflessness. And you ought not just look at this and say, oh, man, boy, boy, I, look, what, look what I got. And then just move on and or bring someone here and say, this is how you get saved. Okay, see you later. Let me go to someone else. This is how you get saved. I'm not discrediting that at all, folks. But there's greater glory for the called and the elect and the strong in the faith that perfect the ones that are being so our soldiers, the ones that are being counted as conformed to the image of his son. That's the difference here. But look at uh, look at verse 15. He that died for all. That selflessness, that they which should, they which live, that selfless live, that's sanctification live upon selflessness, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I said before people, all they do is see, oh, die for me, rose again, death, burial, and resurrection. But they don't see the part that just was right before it, that we should live unto him and not unto ourselves that's and how you how do you do it the love of christ verse 14 constrains us wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh yea though we have known no christ after the flesh yet now henceforth we know him no more and every you know i used to look at this because i heard the teaching well when you see this here we don't know christ when he was on the earth we don't know him when he was in the flesh. We know him as Christ and him crucified. We're supposed to... I've heard that, folks. That's not what this is talking about at all. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about... Well, I'll get to that in a second. Let's just read on because it's going to make sense here. Verse 17. Therefore, it, this is explaining it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away becomes, because, behold, all things become new. This is a calling to be more than just justified, folks. That's what this is a calling uh, uh, unto you to be. And all things are of God who hath reconciled. Now, notice he's talking about God's love. But just because, remember, Christ's love was just talked about in verse 14, 15, 16, uh, and, and 17. Uh, look at verse 18. All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. What do you think this is? The ministry to justification unto eternal life? Only to wit that God was in Christ. And notice this talking about God now again. To wit God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Notice unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we as ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. You know there's a lot there that people miss. The ambassadors for Christ, the in Christ's stead. Now, if this is the case, and we're here for Christ and in, in His stead, do you think He would only just desire that we be we be ambassadors to only just get people justified unto eternal life, or you think He'll have more for us than only just that? Well, I would hope you would know that there's more. <laughs> Again. People only see I'm an ambassador because I go out there and knock on doors or, or talk to people. That's, again, I'm not discrediting that at all, folks. I cannot do that. Anytime someone's justified unto eternal life and placed out of Adam and into Christ, that is glorious in itself. But there is more 
than only just that. Look at verse 21. For he that he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no, who knew no sin, that we might be, notice this, made the righteousness of God in him. It, the righteousness of God in him is not only just talking about that. It's talking about what the next verse is going to say in, in the next chapter. This is the next verse in the next chapter. Look at verse chapter 6, verse 1. We then, in other words, we then, as workers together with the church, no, with him. Notice that with him, him that is a power establishing you, you're working together with him, you're laboring with him. He's chosen you if you allow to be the chosen. Beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Why do you think he says also? Because Paul is putting you on the same labor ministry. I, I'll just say it that way. That he is in. He, we are here in his stead. We are the representatives, ambassadors, soldiers for Christ's sake, the elect. Look at verse 2. For he saith, I heard thee in an accepted time, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, giving, an un giving not, no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. And when you see that, now is the day of salvation. That's not talking about now is the time to get people justified unto eternal life. But it's explaining to you, you ought to act like you, now is it, it, that the time is here, folks. Honest, walk honest as in the as in the day. As in the day. And what do you think is taught over here in Romans 13 about, uh, about the day and how we ought to put off this, cast off, cast off, or put on this? And is isn't just saying only just justification unto eternal life. Wait on the rapture to come. Well, you 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 you, you to act as Romans chapter six says, and and uh, um, be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, and assume that what that means is only just. Well, I'm gonna go be going to church. Well, I'm not gonna do that no more. I'm not doing this no more. I'm not discrediting that either, but the idea is that there's more to being that, that God's desiring that we be, that we put on. Let's move on. Come over here to first, uh, Second Corinthians. Let's look at chapter, uh, look at verse, 2 Corinthians 6. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 4 now. And, oh boy, look at the time. Uh, but in all things approving, notice approving ourselves as the ministers of God. In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. Wait a minute. You know how they're approving themselves? They're a workman that's approving themselves in the sight of God because they're being what God called them to be. If you're being what God called you to be, you're going to be approved because you're being, you're putting off and cast, putting on, casting off and putting on him. But what's going to happen when you do it, folks? in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fasting. Now, I'm going to stop with all these ends here. This is, you're going to be going through, you're in these things. And I know you're not getting stripes for the gospel or imprisonments for the gospel. I, I get that. But what you are getting you're getting different types of things. Just the idea if you're if you're uh, uh, laboring in the ministry and you're persecuted for Christ's sake, the only way you're going to be persecuted for Christ's sake, folks, is you have to testify of the darkness. You have to testify of the evil, even if it's among them who rightly divide the word of truth that are not walking the way God desires. And if you give them the reproof, you give them the exhortation, as I as I, I try to do, as I no as I do, um, they're not going to want to hear it. And the stuff I said here, or the things that I've said in in the the attributes of Satan, the man and the woman the, after the attributes of Satan, and I and I put the pastor and church 
you know, people think, why did he go after me so hard in that video? It wasn't. I, the video was showing the actual, how the church that rightly divides the word of truth in many other churches. I know the ones that rightly divide the word of truth are going to be the only ones to watch this. But how they can do the practices and traditions and commandments of men and it's after the attributes of Satan is why we do these things. So it's not going after anyone personally. It's the doctrine that we don't leave behind, that we pick up and we brought from those denominations. We carried them over and made, made what we call grace a denomination of itself. But look at verse, uh, verse 6. By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by, notice this, love and fame. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, by love and fame, and this is how it gets done. Those things, pureness, knowledge, long-suffering, and kindness, by, and the Holy Ghost, that's how we get these things done when we're in stripes, imprisonments, turmoils, labors, watching, fasting, persecutions, afflictions, and patience, and all those things, you use pureness and knowledge and long-suffering and kindness in those things. You operate upon the doctrine of the Holy Ghost. You operate upon selfless love unfeigned. That's how it gets done. Look at verse 7. By the word of truth, by the power of God, notice this, by the armor of of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. You notice how when it's talking about sufferings, armors being used, powers being used, that's because you're going to put it on. You're going to operate him that is uh, uh, of power now, uh, um, him that is being educated by him that is of power. If him that is of power is educating you, establishing you, you're able to operate upon the power of God the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, folks. But it's the word of truth that does it. Look at verse 8. By honor and dishonor, and by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and well known, yet well known, as dying, behold, we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. You know, this is how your viewpoint ought to be. Because even though you're looked upon as having dishonor, it's honor unto your father. Even though you're given evil report, it's good report amongst the saints. Because if, as Paul, I just say this here, Philippians chapter 1, Paul was looked upon as dishonor. Evil report was given. He was looked upon as a deceiver, unknown, uh, all, all, all them things. But guess what? He was of honor amongst them that were perfect. The ones that were perfect, that was good report that Paul was suffering for Christ's sake. But uh, I, you, get, you get that. Look at uh, chapter 6, verse 11. Oh, ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. Wait a minute. What's our heart got to do with this now? What is Paul in the disciples' heart? Because he's given them an example that you see all these things we just went through here and all these things and how we got it done, how we became more than conquerors as a soldier, how we did it is here. Selfless love, love unfeigned. His heart is enlarged. Your heart ought to be enlarged too and you can do it too is what he's about to say. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are, ye are straightened in your own bowels. They're only thinking about their own sakes. Now for recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Enlarge your hearts too, folks. That's what's being said here. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are all, for ye are the temple. Let me not say all. For ye are the temple of the living God. Hey, folks, we are the temple of the word of God can dwell richly within us if we allow him, 
his word to dwell richly within us. As God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them. I will be their God and they should be my people. You think this is talking about every single saint? Well, this talks about that his desire is that every single saint be this. Yes. But not every justified saint in Christ is going to do what you're about to see here. Verse 17, wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be unto you, a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Not all saints are going to come out from among them. Not all saints are going to, to be separate. But God cannot receive you. Well, if that's the case, he's talking to justified people. Why can't he just go receive them? They don't have to come out from among them. He just got through explaining you can't have part with, with Belil and the part with this. You can't have agreement with that and agreement with this. You can't have concord with this or concord with that. You can't have fellowship with this and fellowship. You can't do both. The Lord's, what Paul is setting forth is, look, I can't, he can't educate you if you're acting like Corinthians. He can't educate you if you have a grace church and you have a choir like the people down the street. He can't educate you if you have pastor anniversary days exalting the man over others. Or you're calling your wife the first lady. He can't receive you if you're doing those things that the people down the street is doing. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive you. We cannot be received, folks, if we're acting as the Baptist, as the Methodist, the, the Pentecost, the all the God can't receive you. He it's that's not well pleasing unto him. You're not operating upon a spiritual mind. When I said the Baptist, I understand some can be justified unto eternal life. He can't receive them because they're doing the, the same things this world does. And I'm not talking about only just paying tithes and, and water baptism. I'm talking about all the other practices that's going on in these places. You can't serve him. You're only serving yourself. The things that you do are only satisfying to your flesh. The satisfying to your flesh and the satisfying to the flesh of the people that hear and see these things. But your father's not well pleased in that, folks. Only way he's well pleased. You're told, Romans chapter 8, how can you please God? Spiritual mind, word of God mind is how you can please him. And you should know based upon what's said here, so, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You being in, you, you doing the things that, that, that your church is used to doing. Oh, let's have an annual so-and-so day. Let's, let's have a, this is our fifth so-and-so, uh, so on. You're only having Bible conferences because it's, it's that time of year. We're, we're doing it for fellowship. What about edifying? What about strengthening the saints to be perfect in the knowledge of his will? What about getting them where they can now teach others? How many is strong? How many is able? How many can you count to be able? And I'm talking to the pastor, the right and divine pastors. How many can you count and say, that man there, he's able. If I'm not here, he's able to strengthen these saints. He's able to build them up. Not just him. I don't know which one to choose from. I got the other one over here. He can do it. He can too. I Maybe if I'm not here to say and, um, I'm in a hospital, have an operation or whatever the issue is, you guys, you four guys will be able to alternate. Man, that would be glorious. Again, many oftentimes we can't say that. Sad to say, folks. But again, I get, I get um, doctrinally, and, and what's coming out for me is glory, folks. It's not anger. It's the idea is that looking at the doctrine here, but then also understanding that we have brothers and sisters in the Lord that's operating upon. Yeah, I'm trying to choose the, the word right. I don't want to say the power of Satan, and I don't want to say the works of darkness. I'm not saying that either. What I'm saying is that our father is being engaged in a warfare that you are taught that you can bruise Satan under your feet. You are the instrument by which God is using the vessel. 
chosen. And he's saying, have you considered my son? And you, you can bruise Satan under your, your feet. It's not your actual foot. It's the doctrine. Quenching the fiery darts of the wicked. All that Satan can do against you. Take the word of God. Allow the God of peace. Operate upon the God of peace. You testify of this world. Come over to uh, first, uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1 verse 8. We're going to move uh, kind of fast through this. But I, we'll go back over this next time. Colossians 1 verse 8. Who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and, de and to desire that ye might be filled with all the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Notice what he says here, your love in the spirit, your love in the living word of God. You know why he knows their love in the living word of God? Because Paul desired that they be filled with knowledge of his will in all all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The idea here is that selfless love is the way to get the is for the way that they're going to be filled with all that. It can be it's at our disposal. I got in front of me the knowledge of God, the will, all his will that he desires that we be privy to. And but again, verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Not all pleasing, and you're walking worthy unto the Lord, you'd be pleasing him in your walk. You'd be pleasing him, being fruitful to every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. And you're walking worthy is you walking worthy as the soldier he intends for you to be, as the call that he intends for you to be, the one that is the perfect. Our strength, Christ's strength is made perfect in our weakness. And you being, that's well pleasing unto him. Singing songs out of a hymn book is not well pleasing unto the Lord. It's only well pleasing unto your own tradition that you came out of. Singing from the hymn books or whatever else you're doing is not well pleasing unto him. It might be well pleasing unto the man that wrote it. Hey, what happened years ago? Why didn't 300 years ago they have that, those same, that same hymn book? Yeah, how else did they bring forth honor and glory? I tell you what they did, they, they preached his word and they got people justified unto eternal life and got them strengthened in the doctrine is what they did. And they learned to, how to sing with true song unto the Lord. They learned true song, wisdom and holiness and, and, and how to bring forth his praises unto him. But look at, um, look, look at uh, verse 11. It strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto the patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Why do you think those words being used there are uh, words people use with when they prepare to battle? Strengthen all might, glorious power. Hey, and then you see patience and long-suffering and joy, joyfulness because that's power. When you're operating upon patience, long-suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks, that is all might. That is the glorious power being put on display. And again, if you're operating, if him that is a power establishing you, you are also operating upon that glorious power that you're strengthened, that you ought to be strengthened with. And notice it says all might. We'll get to that when we come back to this next time. But look at verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And again, made us meet. People just look at that and say, I'm seated in heavenly places. You... When you're operating upon verses nine through uh, verses eight on down here, it, that being partake of the inheritance of the saints in light, you're, you're counted worthy and meet. Look at Ephesians chapter four. Let's come over to Ephesians chapter four and look at verse one. Matter of fact, come over to Colossians chapter three, verse ten. I'll just read that. Come over to Colossians chapter three and verse ten instead. But in Ephesians chapter 4, I was just going to read the verse that said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are, ye are called. And some people, when they see that, they think that's only talking about our, our heavenly vocation and heavenly places. But this is saying that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And it's going to give you some things of the idea is that 
your being perfect in doctrine, that ye be not tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, that ye be as Ephesians chapter 5 is going to say, and Ephesians chapter 6 is going to say, this, we then that are strong, and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Look at Colossians chapter 3 verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew nor circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, nor free. Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels, and, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Now, said that pretty quick there because I'm going to go back over next time. But again, putting on the new man as the elect of God, uh, being one that's called according to his sake, putting on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. You putting on all those things and putting on more and putting on more, you're putting on layers of doctrine. You're putting on layers of his armor, as Ephesians chapter 6 talked about. It says, put on this and then put on the breastplate. Have your feet shut about. You're building. You're building up doctrine that you are putting on. You can't just, as I said before, for those that, that just look at this and, and they get offended by it and just goes over the head and they get offended by what's being said are ones who haven't put on enough doctrine yet. They haven't put on, as if Ephesians, in, in Ephesians 5 and Colossians says, put on this and then put on that. Put on therefore. You, you keep, you're constantly putting on, but the capstone is love, selfless love. And as I said before, it shouldn't offend anyone because I made mention about singing hymn books and things like that. People don't like for you to take away what they what their heart loves. Remember, the heart of men loves the idea when he can sing a song on a baritone note or sing it a certain way that no one else can. Or he can be glorified because he can really blow that song out so perfectly. Or they can play a certain instrument unlike others. Or create a new song for people to hear. And I understand at the root of it, people will say, wait a minute, brother, what? the word of God is being put on display. Well, guess what? The Jehovah Witnesses do it as well. You got the, the Methodists walk around, and, and the Mormons, and, and many people walk around with the word with the word of God. They'll even walk around with the King James Bible. You got the people who call themselves Hebrew Israelites. They walk around with the King James are they putting the word of God on display? Yeah, they read the verses, same verses we do. Again, the idea, folks, it's instead of wasting time is the point. Worrying about or wasting five to ten minutes, turn to page 78. Now, why don't you turn to, turn to one of your father's verses and do, I, I'm glad, this is an hour and 23 minutes. I wish I had more, I'm not saying I wish I had more time, I could keep going, but the idea is I, we run out of, of the, the selected time. And you got people wasting time, well we got to get, we, we start at 11, we start Bible study at 10, service at 11, and we, let's play songs and testimony, and then give me 30 minutes to, to say something and tell a little joke in between there. Your father's displeased with that type of rhetoric. He's displeased with that. I don't care who the Bible pastor, teacher, preacher is. This is about my father's word. I'm not giving onto onto anybody from any any different uh, uh, camp or any type of. Oh well, pastor so and so is not going to like to hear you say that. The idea, folks, is I'm chosen by him, who have chosen me to be a soldier, and the idea in the him too as a power establishing me in the doctrine here. I can bruise Satan under my feet by not operating upon this world's 
by by being wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And as I said before, the things that you see the church world do is the evil. I don't as I don't have to have anything behind me, any 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 plants or 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 uh, books in, in back of me like everyone else do. I, I'm giving you the doctrine. I, I want you not to be distracted. I'm giving you the doctrine so you can get that. Not what else is going on. I don't have to have something looking different here, microphone sitting there. I don't have to do all that. Folks, I give it to you so you can be edified by what's being said here. Again, until next time, we're going to be looking at the doctrine uh, about being the called and the chosen soldiers for Christ. That's what Paul is getting to in Romans chapter 16 here. And that's what he's establishing the saints in. And, and, and I, I desire that that you, hopefully, what I've said could either offend or edify. That's the point. But many people would just look at it and they'll just put three minutes into it and say, eh, move on to the next person. They want to hear something that says, they want to hear a video that says, uh, the blood of Christ. That'll get a lot of views. Because then people are only going to just, oh, that's all they can handle is only just justification unto eternal life. And again, I'm not discrediting the blood of Christ. I can't, I cannot do that. But I'm bringing, trying to bring forth honor and glory unto what your father desires that you be. But I'm saying when people are only just instructors in Christ, the simple can only just ingest that. They can't ingest anything else, any meat. But next time we're going to be dealing with this. Um, and I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And until next time, thank you.